I'm out of breath. I ran back here to be able to get on a landline to call you. So That's dedication, man. I appreciate that. <laughs> You're welcome. Are, is your leg and your hip in running shape yet? <laughs> no, 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 that was uh, not a literal sense of the word there, uh, but, but, but I was moving fast. All right, so that's, that's good news that you're at the governor's mansion talking to the governor, so you guys are on good speaking terms and ready to negotiate here about this tax cut. Yeah, we had our majority leaders over there. Uh, well, Eric Householder wasn't there for, for, I think he was on the radio somewhere. He was with me, and, actually. Oh, is that where he was at? Yeah. Well, he should have been over there. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, the, the majority leaders, the finance chairs, and then the governor and the speaker and myself were there. Uh, going over, uh, you know, setting the course forward uh, for this session. So uh, the governor's uh, making a pitch for his 50% tax cut. It's a little bit, and as I said, Tom, it's a little bit premature for me because we just now got the, the budget bill yesterday, late last night. I've got a team that's going through it, uh, looking to see what's going on uh, with that. And we're still trying to digest everything before we make comments. So I'm telling you that as well. Uh, because you're going to ask me to make comments on some of this, yes. it's going to be difficult to do uh, until I get all the information. Well, how about in, in general, the governor said that he was asked to, to make a big splash because he met with Craig Blair, he met with Roger Hanshaw, and, and they said it's got to be big or it's not worth doing. And he said, well, I'm here to do a cannonball, and I'm going to make a West Virginia tsunami out of it, 50%. Uh, make no mistake about it. I think I've said this on your show, uh, and I know I said it in the Speaker's office, and I've been firm about that, is, is that if we're going to do a tax reduction, it has to be done in a way that has uh, economic repercussions, and that means good ones. We don't want to go down the path to Kansas. What we want to do is be able to have employment activities. It's not good enough just moving people to the state of West Virginia. You've got to have jobs for them, and that's the trick. You need to have those jobs investments, so whether it's getting rid of the personal property tax in its entirety or uh, you see those economic uh, take place at 50 percent. If you reduce the uh, personal income tax by 50 percent, now you'll see people that will actually move their businesses, locate business to the states, and, and then that gives employment opportunities, and labor will actually gravitate there, and that actually gives you the growth that you're, that you're looking for. Craig, who does the dynamic scoring for this? Because if I get a 50% income tax cut, it's not like the state loses the 50%. I spend that money on things that generates more sales tax. It might create more commerce. More things need to be manufactured. More people need to be hired. More payroll taxes are then collected. So as it works out, it's, it's obviously not a 50% loss in revenue. Co correct. Uh, and uh, you can actually scale the, up to, that, that if you have businesses move in and they put billions of dollars in investment, and, you know, we're on a track record for being very successful on that, and pay close attention. I'm, I'm not talking, but there's more. Uh, that that uh, is happening in this state. And the more people that you can put to work in this state, the greater that you can reduce the taxes and the better that uh, the infrastructure is going to be. Uh, and the educate, well, I'll, I'll throw education into infrastructure at this point in time. Uh, so you get the things, instead of being on a downward spiral, you're on an up, upward, you're on that escalator. And that's what we're looking for. So when you hear us uh, argue Arguing back and forth with each other and all that. It's a matter of, of how do you do, take this prosperity and grow further prosperity. John? Uh, yes, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, good morning. The um, Yesterday, I believe it was, today's Thursday, right? Yes, yesterday, uh, the Senate passed 12 bills, among which was a restructuring of DHHS that essentially, is, as I look at it, um, renders the McChrystal report sort of a, a non-entity. Um, is is that in fact the case? Was uh, first of all, you got twelve bills. You got to be kidding me. We passed twenty-three or twenty-four. I lost track of what it was. You're right. It was twenty-three. It was twenty-three. I have it in my notes, and I didn't refer to them. Twenty-three. Yeah. Uh, and. Uh, 
uh, yes, we did DHHR. Why? Because it's in crisis mode. We've already been in negotiations with the House delegates. We know what we're doing when it comes to that. We've got Jeremiah Samples on our team also. And this is phase one of probably three-phase approach that will take about five years for us to get to be able to get to DHHR headed on the right path. Make no mistake about it. I believe the McChrystal report was nothing but a waste of a million dollars. Uh, and I warned them whenever that the, the, the they vetoed last year's bill that the report had to be an accurate report. It couldn't be something where the Secretary Crouch come in and said what he wanted done. Then the report basically mirrored that. And that's exactly what happened. And uh, you can see who's finally gone uh, on this. Uh, he's, quote, retired, air quotes there. Uh, but he's gone. And so we're going to set the course here and uh, and fix the DHHR long term. Um, so our CPS workers, our children will be taken care of, our vulnerable will be taken care of. It's long overdue, and we're going to get there on that. Also, I'm looking at our Facebook feed here. Could you address the whole issue of suspending the rules to get these bills passed on the first day? Uh, the, the rule suspension, I've done that since I've been the Senate president, for that matter. We've worked year-round down here, and our caucus meets frequently. In fact, uh, for the last two days uh, we've met uh, on that, you know, before the session started. Even the new members were here, not getting paid, being aware of what's going on. We met back in December and went over bills that we had in the pipeline that needed to be addressed. But the vast majority of the bills that we did yesterday had already passed. 33 or 34 to nothing. And there were Democrat bills in there. So it wasn't about, you know, Republicans running over top of the Democrats. One of them was drug houses. That's what I call it. Let's put it that way. That Senator Wolfel needed in Cabell County because they bring people in uh, that are on drugs. They put them in the house until their money runs out. They throw them out. Then they move the next one in. It's got the money. And it attracts these drug addicts in. And it's a racket. And it's now taking place in Wood County, for that matter. And we're trying to bring an end to it. So there's some urgency on getting things done. And uh, anybody that knows me uh, knows that uh, I'm about efficiency. I'm about getting the job done. Now, the, the, I, I get the biggest kick out of it. The Democrat Party uh, the, to, for the state of West Virginia is coming out complaining, saying there's no transparency. That's baloney. Uh, <laughs> and it was left up to them that we'd still be in the doldrums in this state. Take a good hard look, ladies and gentlemen, uh, on what's taking place in this state. There are changes happening uh, every day. Good things to make your lives better, make it so that you got more money in your pocket, making it so that your children are better educated and the infrastructure is improving. And you want to go back to the days of having the Democrats run the party, then you let them or, or run in this state, then do. Do. Uh, vote for them in here. But the fact is, is that they're just complaining. Well, also, isn't it true when a minority party is so much in the minority as it is right now, there are precious few options other than try to slow things down? Well, I guess you could say that, but I've been there before. Okay? I've been there. Uh, and the fact is, is you should still be, instead of complaining, you should be trying to figure ways to work to, re to rebuild the state. Look, whenever I was in the minority party, workers' comp was a big, big, a big deal. None of these things that we're talking about today would make a difference. Senator Manchin, who was governor at the time, or what well, soon was governor, uh, he was Secretary of State, but he ran on that. He came in, he took a hard lift. His own members in the party, a lot of them, that are barking today of uh, saying that, oh, no, you can't fix workers' comp and all. He took a hard lift on that, and I give Senator Manchin full credit. Notice who I'm giving credit to, because well, he took it on, and I gave him credit the last two days. We've been together a little bit in speaking engagements, and uh, and I, I bring that up uh, because it's important to put credit where it's due and that's exactly what i intend to do moving forward uh but for mike pushing's gang that that wants to complain all the time that uh, i don't even want to hear about it start telling us how to make things better because mike wolfel a democrat did and we passed his bill out of uh, quickly of uh, yesterday speaking of mike pushkin he'll join us tomorrow morning at 805 
Uh, Craig, we haven't mentioned this yet uh, this morning, uh, about a minute and a half left here, and that is the governor actually brought up locality pay and appears to be championing it for this upcoming legislation. Any hope? Uh, d- yes. Uh, and so let's uh, d- d- so be, pay close attention. Uh, ask Pushkin that question tomorrow. Ask the unions. Get Dale Lee in here uh, on your show and start asking questions about that. It's about time that they, t- uh, you know, pull their head out of the sand and realize the cost of living is different in, in different areas of this state. Of uh, And it's really the, the cost of living is the housing and the taxes associated with that housing. It's time to be able to make it so that everybody uh, is treated uh, fairly, and sometimes that means not the same wage. So I applaud the governor for what he said on that. 5% pay raise. Could it be more than 5% or is 5% where everybody wants to kind of settle at the max? Well, now you're hitting on something that uh, we're, I still don't have all the numbers yet. And, you know, I'd sort of like to do a 5% pay raise myself, but... I don't know where it's at. The governor, I, it sounds to me like he had $7 billion in spending on uh, to, to where we got a revenue stream of $6 billion. So there's, a, there's a shortage there. I still have to do the analysis. That's a, a call for a week from now. Uh, so once I get an understanding on everything that's taking place, and I can do a better job of answering Craig, thank you Where for your, we may be. Thank you for your time this morning. As always, I hope to be able to speak with you frequently enough during the legislative session, sir. Yeah, well, I'm sorry I was delayed, but uh, that that meeting this morning was a priority, and uh, it's off to a good start. It's cool. I don't mind finishing second to the governor. That's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> you have a good day. You too.